Good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Alison Johnston, presiding officer of this Parliament, and I would like to share a warm, a warm welcome to this year's Festival of Politics. Particularly thrilled that we are back together in person this year. This year's event celebrates 18 years of the festival, and we have been inspiring and engaging audiences from every walk of life to enjoy to enjoy debate in a safe and respectful environment and you know it's just a great opportunity to to welcome in people and to learn from from you too i'm very pleased today that you can join us to participate in this event with our excellent panel the event is brought to you in partnership with elect her and elect her is an organization that works to motivate support and equip women to stand for elected office in all spheres and different levels of government providing them with the knowledge, the confidence, and the skills that they may need to do it. And later on, we'll have a, we'll have a full and frank discussion, and there'll be lots of opportunity for you to get involved and to put questions to our panelists. And of course, if you're keen to share your thoughts, you can do this by using the hashtag FOP2022. Well, I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Meryl Kenny, by Talat Yacoub, by Sophie Reid, and by Fiona Matavo. Dr. Meryl Kenny is a senior lecturer in gender and politics at the University of Edinburgh and co-director of the Centre on Constitutional Change. I, I seem to have my notes in alphabetical order, so we'll, we'll switch to Fiona. Uh, Fiona Matavo is the co-founder of the award-winning social enterprise Radiant and Brighter Community Interest Company and a leading voice on diversity and inclusion. Fiona is also a Women's Enterprise Scotland Role Model Ambassador. Sophie Reid is the Chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament, a trustee with YouthLink Scotland and a spokesperson for Girl Guiding Scotland. And Talat Yacoub is a campaigner, a commentator and an independent consultant. She is co-chair of the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you. I would also like to welcome our BSL interpreters for today's session, uh, Sharna Dixon and Heather Graham. Thank you and welcome. Now, there will be an opportunity, of course, for, for you all to put questions and views to the panel throughout this event. But if I may, I'd like to start by asking, and I, I'll, I'll put this to, to all members of the panel, and we'll, we'll start with yourself, Fiona, and move this way. Can I ask what difference you think it makes having women in the political room making decisions and policy? It's funny you start with that question because we had a discussion with my husband who sat right there as we were coming today. I said to him, do you know what? It does make a difference. There's a reason as to why um, and I, I, just bear with me here, indulge myself. I gave birth to boys and girls. I know the pain of both men and women, right? And he said, excuse me, I was part of it. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it makes a difference because we make half the population here in Scotland. Um, we have the lived and learned experience of uh, of how we live here in Scotland and what we do and the way we do things here. And if we are not in the room, how could we put possibly represent the views and the perspective of half the population? So it does make a difference because it ensures that we are not encoding the biases that we have within ourselves in the policies that we are developing. It also matters that we have women of different backgrounds and different ethnicities. Obviously, as a, as, a, as a black woman, I've got to say, it's important that we think about all women from different perspectives, from different areas, from different backgrounds, so that we are sure that we are working to, to enshrine what we need changed, what we need done in a way that includes everybody in a meaningful and relevant way, which I don't think is happening when, we don't, when we're not in the room. Thank you, Fiona. It's Sophie? Yeah, I think the, the changes within the political system ripple out into wider society. 
Um, and I think we see large problems when women are left out of policy making. I think um, a really prominent area um, in the discussion around women's safety is urban policy. Um, and you see um, urban areas designed for and by men. Um, and that's caused huge problems, even in the smallest of not having enough street lighting in areas. So we see the real life problems that happen when women are left out. I think one of SYP's key values is diversity um, and I'm really proud to be a, a female chair of the organisation and we have a female vice chair as well um, and our gender split is, is quite equal with 50% female, 45% male and 5% non-binary and gender fluid um, and I think that that makes us able to truly represent everyone across Scotland and ensure that everyone's voices are included. Thank you Sophie. Tell that. Well, obviously, I, I agree with my panel. I think you're going to see quite a lot of that on this, on this panel. So if you're looking for, for back and forth, it might not happen quite in the same way. I think that um, I think the question is about having women in positions of power does change the culture that occupies that space of power. But one of the things that's really important that I like to point out as much as possible is I want to see women in positions of power because it reflects barriers on sexism and misogyny that exists in, in society, that means that they don't get positions of power. But I don't only want to see women in power, I want to see women who are feminist, anti-racist, with an intersectional pers um, perspective in positions of power. And what we tend to see, um, and you know, research has told us this time and again, is that there's two things that happen as a consequence of women being in power. There is a ripple effect across society, like you've said, so we see more women who are likely to come forward to be part of political systems, both locally, at the community level, within the public sector more widely. So there is a representation effect that it has. But there's a second effect about which issues are on the table to discuss. So I firmly believe if we had had fair representation of women for generations, childcare would be considered an economic core issue. Caring and unpaid care would be considered a core economic issue rather than this thing that happens on the side of the economy. These issues that disproportionately women are experiencing would more likely be at the forefront of politics. And what we see is when there are more women there, there's more likely to have those experiences and those conversations around positive policy change happening. But that happens both with women there, but women who have the interests of other women in politics as well. Thank you. And Meryl? Yeah, uh, it, unsurprisingly, I, th I echo what my, what my fellow panellists have said, and I think it points to um, the potential for women that they can, and I say can and not will, because I think that's a complex relationship that depends on the institutions they're in, the parties they're in, whether they're new, whether they're experienced politicians, etc., but that they can have impacts on, uh, or rather more gender-balanced parliaments can have impacts on ways of working and how you do politics, outcomes in terms of policy, but also just to pick up what Tala has just said around political interest and engagement with politics more broadly, not only in terms of women's political engagement and feeling more engaged with politics, but actually there's research that suggests that both men and women have more positive views, for example, of democracy uh, when you have more gender balanced uh, uh, parliaments. So I think that it's actually tied up with not only questions about political inclusion, but also about representation and democracy more broadly. And those questions are really important right now when, when democratic principles and institutions are under threat in many parts of the world. Now, a recent report, you may be well aware of it, produced by the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, identified that political parties themselves were one of the biggest barriers to women standing for election. I'd be interested to learn what changes you'd like to see in our political parties to encourage more women and a more diverse range of women into politics. Um, and I'll go to Sophie first. Yeah, I think that's a really important step is the culture within political parties themselves um, welcoming women um, into positions. I think we've seen moves um, to have 50-50 candidates so on the electoral register. Um, and I think that's a really great step forward, but I don't think we're seeing that across the board. Um, and I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, SYP is a politically impartial organisation and we work with all types of parties um, and it's, it's really important to get 
um, women's views from across the spectrum um, to make sure that they are totally represented. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, the culture that needs a, a quite a swift change within all political parties. Tala, to your views? So political parties are a problem. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I'm just going to be completely honest. Okay, Political parties are a problem. And they're a problem in lots of different ways. If you, you see women as a numbers game, what you will have is a revolving door of women participating, experiencing horrible cultures and leaving. What you need to do is create cultures where women want to participate, stay and progress. So the issue isn't, so I say this as somebody's part of Women 5050, but we advocate not just for women to be on the ballot paper, but for women to be in winnable seats, okay? It doesn't matter if you're just saying that there's a woman here so we've ticked the box. Where are they in the winnable seats? Where are they when they get decision-making um, positions within political parties? Or are they sidelined whilst the men have their meetings in the kind of old boys club type ways that continues to this day? So political parties have understood that there is scrutiny on the numbers around election time. But what they haven't understood is what are you doing to support and empower women and create cultures where they are safe to participate outside of election time. That's when you see a political party take things seriously. And what I need them, the question was what they need to change. I have many ideas. <laughs> um, political parties um, have been written to about all of these ideas multiple times. Um, but a few things. One reporting mechanisms of sexual harassment, sexism, misogyny, bigotry, abuse, transphobia needs to be written um, needs to be written and then taken seriously. Not a process where you don't feel that things are transparent, are safe for you to participate or that the issue won't be acted on. So that's one reporting needs to be dealt with when it comes to experiences that women have within parties. Two, you have to invest in women not just two months before elections because you realise you need them on the ballot paper, but throughout your existence as a political party. And the third thing they can do is start considering um, the issue around um, financial contribution when you are participating in political parties and you want to run as a candidate. It takes a fair amount of money to actually be a candidate. And if you are a woman who, women are more likely to be in low paid precarious work and doing unpaid care. How do those things work when you have to put in time and a lot of money to be a candidate? So what are we doing to be able to invest in women um, to be candidates in the first place? Meryl, on political parties. Yeah, uh, um, I think there's a lot to say here. I think um, the main thing to say is, is just to emphasise that particularly where we are in the UK, but in most countries in the world, it's not just a case that you can stand up one day and say, I want to run for office. You have to be selected by a party, right? So, so they're the key gatekeepers. And what parties will often tell you if they have low numbers of women is, look, there are just not enough women out there, right? But then you find when they're required to select women through measures like gender quotas, for example, that they manage to find them. Right, um, so I think there's things about, it's about um, flipping the, the focus to parties as this is where change needs to happen. It's not, it's not a matter of women fixing politics, it's a matter of parties changing their cultures, as others have said. Yeah. I think one of, the, one of the biggest and most successful measures to, to increase uh, numbers of women's representation is, is gender quotas, but as, as others have highlighted, those need to be measures with teeth that actually select women and diverse women for winnable seats. Um, but alongside that are all the kind of uh, things, and quotas can have an impact on culture because once you start to change presence and you change the kinds of people you're getting into politics, that can also have a knock-on effect in terms of your ways of working. But also things around opening up the criteria, the application forms, what do you think a good candidate is? And how do those kind of criteria map onto particular kinds of professional people with unbroken work records, right? Which, which, which map onto particular people, but also things like, how do you organize your activities? And this gets to Talat's point about resources. If everything's happening late at night and it requires you to shell out a lot of money and you don't have childcare and those kinds of things, and it, and, it, and it prioritizes a kind of speechifying kind of model of politics. Who are you excluding? So it's about thinking of those things in the round and quotas is a really important mechanism, but situated within a wider reform strategy. Thank you. And Fiona, what um, changes would you like to see from our political parties to encourage more women, more diverse women into politics? Yeah, first of all, I think we've been sold a lie. 
it doesn't have to be about political parties. Increasingly, what we see and what we know is that political, being in a political party requires you to tread a political line. Actually, the change that I'd like to see is for us to be an ethics-driven um, society where we value those that come with ethics and values that we believe in. Increasingly, what we know now is that whoever, whoever says what is politically right or what, who treads the line wins. We need to change that thinking. It's not about who thinks they can lead wins. It should be who has the representation, the ability to represent our values, our ethics, what we believe in, what we believe to be core to society. Who is, what, is, what does humanity really mean to us? And I think we need to change that thinking. In every era, there is a change in thinking. If the pandemic hasn't changed us, then we've not learned anything. We need to start thinking about our ethics. We need to start thinking about who we want to represent us because they have the values that we believe in. They have the thinking that we believe in. And we need to stop putting leaders into roles just because they won and start putting them into roles because they believe in what we believe in. And we believe in what they believe in because they can represent us in a way that is value-based. Thank you. And I think sort of following on from that, there are concerns that the political culture, what you know, people see, um, you know, the, the tones of debates, social media, discussions can be very off-putting. They can seem hostile, aggressive. It can be an environment where we're not looking at the best of, of, of ethics, uh, if I might put it like that. So, you know, many women speak about the microaggressions, if you like, that they face as they make their political journey as they try to take part as fully as they might wish. Do you, I'd be interested in your views on how these women should deal with this kind of behaviour or even, you know, blatant direct discrimination that they might face. Do you think they should do that the moment it occurs? How do you think they should tackle that issue? Because obviously we, we are here to discuss the fact that we don't have representation you know we don't we don't have a fully representative parliament at the moment i mean we were all very thrilled that it was 45 percent but what does that say to, at the moment you know we have 45 percent women it's never been so good but we shouldn't be jumping for joy at that we should be using it as you know an absolute it's an achievement here but that tells you something too so as we push for this parliament that truly reflects the people of scotland how do we better empower people to deal with these these aggressions i'll go to tala first sure i think i think if we talk about it in terms of how do women better deal with it we again put the onus on women to deal with the discrimination that they face mm. um i'd much rather the focus was on perpetrators and the social media platform owners mm -hmm. okay that have abdicated themselves of responsibility now, social media is in some ways wonderful. Women 50-50 wouldn't exist with the traction it has been given if it wasn't for Twitter. But at the same time, Twitter is a horrifying experience many, many times. I have been at the receiving end of racism, Islamophobia and misogyny and a mix of all those things at the same time when I have deigned to have an opinion, right? Women already are opting themselves out of those spaces mm -hmm. or they are protecting themselves by putting them, their, their um, comments on private mode. Or They're already restricting themselves in a platform that's meant to be public and free for use. The onus has to be on um, reporting mechanisms that are fit for purpose, mm -hmm. but on social media platforms that have some kind of global accountability for how they exist right now, not to get into too much detail of all, but the way in which it's it's been created, the algorithms favour um, toxic debate. They favour retweets, they favour um, what is hostile conversations that are doing lots of back and forth. So they amplify the disagreement and that's not a safe space for most people to participate in. Um, and also Twitter is where nuance goes to die. So um, <laughs> that also makes it quite a difficult place to debate in. Um, when it comes to the experiences on social media, there have been numerous reports on this, and we see this all the time. Women time and time again say, when I put my opinion out there, I get so much flack for it that I don't think I want to really participate in politics. And social media performance has become such a 
intrinsic part of politics, despite the majority of voters actually not being on Twitter and it being an echo chamber. But it's become a real performance. Um, but what we do know is women disproportionately get disproportionately high levels of misogynistic abuse and violent abuse um, on social media. And if you are a woman of colour, it's even higher. So in a, a case, uh, case work that was done with uh, research that was done by Amnesty UK, they um, assessed the 2015 general election and they assessed how women MPs were treated on social media. Diane Abbott, as a black woman, the first black woman in um, Westminster, received so much abuse that she skewed the results and she had to be taken out of the um, research analysis and, and given two pages of analysis of her own because she got so much more abuse than the average woman who was participating. So it's an issue of the intersection of racism and uh, misogyny there. But the issue is with political parties taking it seriously and social media platforms being taken to task for it and accountability created. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Talat. Um, I'll go to Sophie next. I mean, we're seeing a, an incredible array of, of talent and young women coming forward and, you know, everything from our, our climate activists and more really becoming part and parcel of all the debates and really making progress. But is there anything that you think we could be doing to better encourage that too? Yeah, I think that something I found really important um, going through kind of as a young woman in politics is, is the support networks that you build. Um, I think that's something that's kept me going a lot. Um, I think within SYP we've had um, groups, we use the phrase in the jar. So if you say if, um, something the, like finishing a sentence with, does that make sense? Or doubting yourself because you're a young woman in that space, we'll say in the jar. Um, and that's a kind of a check on each other to make sure that we aren't doubting each other in that space. Um, but I also think that the onus shouldn't be on women um, to encourage each other. The, the discussions that we were having earlier about the systematic change that needs to happen, I think that is the key to encouraging young women to go into politics. Um, I think on social media, um, myself, I've experienced abuse. Um, when I was 15, I wrote a, an article on um, the 16 days of activism um, for sexual harassment and abuse of women, or violence against women, um, for a national newspaper. Um, and there was a photo included of me wearing a dress and there was comments from, from men as a 15 year old girl commenting on the length of my dress um, and making kind of sexual comments about it. I think it's such a difficult thing to, to deal with and there isn't anything that you can do in that moment and I think the points about how to deal with social media are so um, valid because there isn't anything an individual can change about that and we need systematic change and accountability um, from social media companies. Thank you. Meryl? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with all the points raised, and I think also it's also a case where political institutions have some responsibility because part of the reason um, women may opt out of running for candidacy is not just what might happen to them in the campaigning, but what it might be like when they get there, right? And whether it's compatible, <laughs> just going to keep going, whether it's, uh, whether it's compatible with them. Um, this is what happens when clothes don't have pockets. This is the... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just going to say. Uh, but, um, so, it's, so it's also about institutional reform, and it's about thinking whether our political institutions are fit for purpose, because there are also questions about what institutions do in terms of security and, and policies around these kinds of things, etc. cetera, um, that's really important to the overall question around kind of violence against women in politics, which has, has a spectrum of what that, that form that takes. Um, but I, I think also some, some of the kind of um, disengagement that, that women are participating in sometimes gets read as women don't have as much interest as politics. There was a study that, that women don't use um, hashtags, you know, like, you know you, like your hashtag for festival of politics or hashtag for elections or things like that. They don't use them as much as men on Twitter. And the, the first read of that was, well, women aren't as politically interested as men. But actually it was because if you use a public hashtag, you open yourself up to quite, quite a lot of uh, barrage of sexist, racist and other abuse. Um, so, so there's a question there about how we conceptualize politics and where politics is happening and that, that women are sometimes finding different spaces or different ways of organizing that um, and, and whether social media is a productive space to, to, to be engaging with politics. 
Fiona, would you like to comment on that? Yes, yes I, uh, I completely agree with uh, the systemic change. We need to focus on the systems and the processes. There is a saying, and, and um, we, we, we we'll, I think we'll all identify with this, but there is a saying that no matter how beautiful a coffin is, no one will be attracted to get into it. Now, if our systems <laughs> look like death, no one's going to want to get into it. So we need to be thinking about how we make them life-giving, how we create spaces that are life-giving, that when I get into that space, I feel safe, I feel secure. And so we can, I could say, okay, here are the things that you could do. Here's how you could protect yourself. Look out for your well-being. Bring women around you. Have people that support you. All those things I could say. But if you have all those things and you're going into a coffin, it's a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. So we really need to focus on the systems, the processes, what is there in place, what, is, what will make women feel safe, how do we create those safe spaces, how do we ensure that the reporting systems do not victimize the people that raise the issues that we actually need to be dealing with. I think that's the, that should be the focus. Yeah, I think I'm learning a lot today. I think there are phrases that we're sharing today that will, will come up again, <laughs> um, and for very good reason. I'm going to um, go out to, to you and ask if there's anything that you would like to put to our panellists at this point. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. Very many women are living in poverty, the, the lowest um, section of society, struggling to juggle finances, care of children and parents and supporting partners, male partners perhaps, uh, and a third have suffered abuse. Mm -hmm. So there's a lack of confidence there very often and there's bullying often from older women, you know, not just mm -hmm. from men. And, you know, how can we empower, you know, empower women and, and support, yeah, as you say, the safe spaces, but mm -hmm. To, to recognise this, that it's, it's getting harder because women are the ones who are feeding and nurturing, often on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that point. Would you like to respond, Meryl? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, um, it's a really broad point and it's about thinking about our pathways into politics have tended to reflect particular backgrounds. And that includes for both women and men in terms of kind of professionalised backgrounds for particular educational backgrounds, particular income brackets. So it's really thinking about that stage before you're selected as a candidate, when people are tapping people on the shoulder or when um, you're, you're getting people to think about standing, is that really crucial stage is when people move from kind of uh, thinking about standing for politics to standing. And that's where I think uh, both parties, but also kind of nonpartisan groups can, can meaningfully invest in terms of both capacity building, like you're talking about, but also financial support in terms of, of the campaigning, et cetera, required. But it really does require rethinking what we think a candidate is and what we think a politician is, which have been uh, made in a particular mold to reflect a particular kind of privileged background. And there are also things, I think, to explore that have been suggested in other reports around, for example, job sharing between politicians and things like that. There's a lot of stuff that we have done in the employment world that pol politics has been kind of insulated from. But, but I think actually we could learn more to think about politics as a job and to think about then how we create diverse pathways into those jobs. Yeah. I think that point about the particular mould is, is very pertinent <laughs> because I believe some 75% of parliamentarians across the globe are men. <laughs> um, so there, there's certainly work to do there. Now, there, were, there was another hand up, would you, yes, please. Hi, um, thank you very much for the discussion. I, I came a little bit late, so I was trying to catch up with everybody. Uh, I, I love the way you guys spoke your points and you're quite practical about things and you, you did touch on a few different topics. So I'll try to keep my train of thought and ask my questions directly. So first of all, I, I love the idea that you say that the responsibility should not just be on women having to deal with uh, the situations. Um, but I wanted to ask from you, the first question would be, in your parties, do you have um, anything in place like a training or like a, a, um, 
it programs, innovations programs, because when you create spaces for women, ideally you want them to be equipped so that they could get into that position, right? It's not just about numbers, but being sure that the person will be able to um, fully take their role and do what they're meant to do. And secondly, the next question I was going to ask is, um, in your positions, what, what influence are you going to make moving forward? Because we've had the problems. We know that they're, it's their systematic problems, their individual problems. But the question is, I really would love to know, is what influence are you going to make moving forward? It's nice to know that we've got 45% of women in parliament. But the question is, what are those 45% of women going to do to ensure that there are going to be changes within, this, within the ways of working, within the parliament itself. And I know it's a process, but we need to start somewhere. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to put that question to Talat. And you can pick up, too, on the, fact, you know, the, the first question there about the sure. challenges that women face anyway on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, so I'll try and do your questions justice. Um, so when we are, um, so the pandemic, the, over the COVID-19, women were disproportionately more likely to be doing more unpaid work. Women are more likely to be unpaid carers. We have reached a million unpaid carers in Scotland, a number we weren't meant to reach until 2030 as a consequence of the pandemic, okay? Now, the reason I put these, this um, information out there is to be able to sh show the extent of care work that is still disproportionately falling on the, the shoulders of women. Women are more likely to be stuck, uh, caught in undervalued, low-paid work. We see them more represented in those spaces. We can do things to be able to boost the confidence of women, but the system is not interested in a confident woman. <laughs> so it's almost like lean-in theory, which is bad. Um, which is, is putting the onus on women doing the work to be there. But if you're not interested in a woman leaning in and you're going to push her back out again, the system isn't working for you. So we have spaces like Elect Her, who do um, kind of development, this, the support, and some of those safe spaces for women. That's what, that's what they exist for. That's brilliant, and that's necessary. That has to be matched by system change happening by gatekeepers and those in positions of power. Mm -hmm. So people who are leading political parties, people who are making economic decisions about the value of care and paid work. Those two things have to happen at the same time for us to meet in the middle and create transformative change. Mm -hmm. So that there's, there's both those things happening. Um, thank you. The question that you asked about um, what are political parties doing. So we are not here, we don't represent any political parties. But Women 5050 asks this quite often of all political parties, what are you doing? Almost all of them have some kind of training programme. Almost all of them have a women's network. My question is, how much power does the women's network have within the party? How much resource and investment does the women's network have within the party? And do you do the training two months before you need a candidate? Or are you doing training, development, support and engagement throughout the time of your existence? OK, so there's that. The second question you asked was about influence and what influence we have. <laughs> do you know, a little while ago, I had to do this thing um, with school children and they were between the ages of six and, and eight and they asked me questions about, you know, how long have you been doing this? How much do you get paid? Because they've got no filter, so they just ask me everything. <laughs> and one of the questions is, do you actually think you've made any change? <laughs> and uh, after a short existential crisis, I um, replied to them. <laughs> But it's, it's much the same as the, con con the question you're asking. What influence do we have? We're using the influence that we have, I certainly am, which is about holding to account and publicly asking questions for transparency of political parties. Women 5050 advocates for legislated candidate quotas, so we push for political parties to sign up to that. Four out of five <clears throat> political parties have. We're also pushing for changes at local council level, because the vast majority of local councils do not have paid, uh, have uh, uh, in place maternity policy for uh, women councillors who need to take maternity leave or partners um, and uh, family leave. So th there are practical things that we are trying to influence um, as best we can. Okay, I know Meryl is keen to come in at this point. Yeah.
can I, can I just say as, as a follow-up to that and, and why Women 50 is advocating for legislative candidate quotas is because underneath that 45% figure that you cite and that we talked about earlier is that actually there's a lot of variation across parties. So not every party is close to that threshold. And when you have, when you have an overall number that's contingent on how different parties are doing things, that means you could go up or you could go way down. And that's why legislative candidate quotas are so important because those would require it put in place all parties to nominate and select a certain number of women. And if they had teeth, they would also require them to select them for winnable seats, right? And there would be sanctions for non-compliance. So that, that's also in terms of the, the longer term aims, why that's so important, yeah. Sophie. Yeah, I'm, I think <laughs> all those points are really important. I think within SYP, um, the board and myself have, um, our key priority for our term is diversity and inclusion. And as part of that, we're working on two different programmes. So um, an anti-racist action plan um, and a women's empowerment programme um, to help support and develop um, young women within our organisation to grow their confidence and skills. Um, I have had so many wonderful opportunities for my involvement um, and I've been able to develop my competence and skills and so we're trying to make that a systematic thing um, that all women um, involved can take part in um, and I think that's really important to, to grow and develop young women. Um, and yeah, I think the influence question is, is really important. I'd like to say that I think I'm influenced just to change even internally within our organisation by having a woman, um, two women at the top of the organisation. Um, I think that it leaves a lot of room for us to, to work on lots of different important things to us. Um, for example, we, myself and Molly, who's our vice chair, um, worked a lot on sexual harassment policies that we have within our organisation last term um, and creating easy access documents to explain how uh, anyone can report a harassment or assault that they face to us and I think these changes are really important even just internally within our organisation. Fiona, your comments on, on both of the, the questions, challenges put to the panel? Yeah, so um, as, as an organisation, Radiant and Brighter, we were formed directly out of our own lived experience of being excluded from the systems and from the policies and everything really, we were completely excluded are not allowed to work due to immigration controls for a period of five years. Um, and when everything we do is really to bring about change. When we started, we thought we need to fix ourselves to fit within the system. And we completely believed that. And we thought we are the problem. We need to think about how we do things. We need to change our ways. We need to be educated. And we did all that. And 10 years later, I'm still here. And I think what we know for sure is that there is a need for system change. But what we also know now is that there needs to be, um, we need to be more system aware. Because when we are not system aware, going back to the first question as well, when we are not system aware, we ourselves become the enemies of each other. Because when the systems beat you and butter you and throw you about, you find yourselves in a position where you're fighting each other. Again, one of, those, one of those sayings, you know, when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. So we end up, you know, getting carried away in a system which has been designed to keep us in those positions that are difficult, challenging, and, 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 and at the bottom. And so our work at Radiant and Brighter includes challenging the systems and processes, and also educating ourselves on the systems and on our own understanding of ourselves. So the more we become self-aware, and the more we become system aware, the more we are able to challenge in a way that is meaningful, educational, and in a way that the system does not come back on us mm -hmm. against ourselves. Okay, thank you, there's a hand there. Before asking my question, I would like to say how nice it is to see a woman presiding officer. <laughs> um, Thank you. My question is this. Given that um, misogyny and chauvinism are terribly embedded, is there actually something in this, and I'm thinking of the work of the Goodison Report, for example, Goodison Group, 
Is there something surely in the curriculum and in the fact that modern studies is not taught in all schools that we are not adequately from the outset preparing women for their role and when I say in public life, I don't mean necessarily um, by being presiding officer, but having a public role and a visibility and a status mm -hmm. and a value in their community, whether that's a hamlet, a village, a town or a city. I, I, we've surely got to get this going from the cradle. I think I'll pass that one to, to Meryl in the first instance, <laughs> given your, <laughs> your, your daily work. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a really important point, and it's about, um, there's been some interesting studies, for example, in the, in the US that look at um, school students and look at how early these ideas about whether or not you might want to participate in politics, whether that's running for office or, as you say, kind of public life more broadly, how, how early those gender differences set in, in terms of um, socialization and other things. So I think, I think your point about the, thinking about the pipeline and thinking about that much earlier, and then in terms of what the curriculum is, um, and I'm thinking about things, uh, when was it, several years ago when they tried to remove feminism from the A-level politics and things like that, right? You know, so, so, so there are things both about what's the content of teaching, but also the visibility of prominent role models, et cetera, and talking about careers. So, so I think it's really important. It's important to think about the pathway and that, and that the moments in which particular uh, groups or, or intersectional identities might decide this is not for me actually may be much earlier than we kind of think they are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so it's important to think about the kind of pipeline in the round. I think that's really important, yeah. I can see that people all want to answer this question. <laughs> um, I'll go back to Fiona, then to, to Sophie and Talat. Um, the question you ask is very pertinent because we know that when children go to school, they get taught by women uh, a lot of the times. And so we see that the children see a woman in a position of authority and in a position of power. But what happens along the way is the question we need to ask. Why does that not translate into a society that sees women with the value that we should? And I think what we need to be thinking through is not only do the young women need to be educated um, through their experiences at home, they need to be educated in the school environment, within the classroom, and outside of the classroom. And some of the things that we are teaching, we are not focusing, and that's where, as a society, we need to start changing. What are we teaching? Why are we so focused and fixated on some theories that do not translate into the world that we live in? I come from a culture where we were taught to just go to school and study. There is no critical thinking until you grow up, you come out of university and you still haven't had any critical awareness of the world that you live in. And so we need to be educating ourselves and educating our young people, our young women, throughout school, throughout the education system. We need to be talking about the things that matter, the importance of valuing women, of appreciating women, and the importance of knowing that we are human beings that can be part of the society that we live in and contribute equitably regardless of the gender. Okay. Sophie. Um, I think education is quite a complex topic. Um, I left school a year ago, I think it must have been. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of things that come into play about young people's interests in different topics. So w whether you like your teacher, whether lessons are engaged in um, and I think a lot of that comes into play, so there's a lot of factors. Um, but I also think it's the importance that the school system places on different topics. So obviously we all know maths and English are <laughs> at the centre, um, but I think that comes down um, a lot to, to those who are in senior management within schools. Um, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I think that there's something to think about as well in, in the kind of curriculum and what has been taught and if it's up to date or not on the issues that young people are finding important. Um, so for example, climate change, that's um, a great example um, that could be used within modern studies, but it's whether teachers are including that or not. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I think the curriculum needs to, to stay up to date to young people's interests to make sure that they're engaged with learning about politics. Thanks, Sophie. And Talat? So there's a couple of things in here in about how we do schooling within Scotland. Um, the Curriculum for Excellence um, was meant to, meant to be the space where, people, uh, where young people were given a more well-rounded education. Um, there were things about citizenship and, and social participation and community within it. But when teachers are so stretched mm -hmm. and when classrooms are, are it's one teacher to 30, 35 pupils, how much of that space to do anything other than the kind of core things that are ticking, up, ticking the box in your exams do you actually have capacity and space for? We tend to do a lot of add-in things in schools, like we're going to talk about um, climate change, we're going to talk about um, physical education, we're going to talk about politics, we're going to talk about all of these different enterprise. But the school curriculum needs space and resources to be able to do that well. So I think, I think there's, there's about how we invest in education and what is prioritised within education. Um, and I think that links to the attainment gap, for example, in, in, in all of this. Um, the second point is, whilst we do tend to focus a lot on education, I think that there's space for that, given the fact that, um, I think there was a report recently, I don't remember the details of it, but um, expressing how many <coughs> young women have experienced sexual harassment in the playground and in their classrooms. So there is a response as to how we deal with young men and boys that perpetu uh, perpetuate that and how girls are enabled to fight against it. So there's that, that issue within schools. But it can't all be directed at schools because then we're waiting for generational change. Mm -hmm. It has to meet somewhere in the middle. Someone can leave school, but then if they're given the same um, uh, messages of objectification, of misogyny, if social media that they participate in still allows the objectification of misogyny and racism to exist, actually the, they will grow into the same issue that we have now. So there has to be a multi-intervention approach across the lifespan. Any more questions? I'll, I'll take um, lead on the third row and then at the front. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there are, um, uh, I have two questions. One is, when we say electorate, we need the electorate, the people who have the ballot papers, uh, which means all of them need to think about her. I think if this is the sample, we have uh, around 10% of, I, I really thank and uh, the men who have come here, with an interest to elector, if we, we need to create an interest in the public for electing her. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to educate and uh, uh, strengthen the women power, empower her, give confidence to her. At the same time, we need to give the idea to the public that we need equal percentage of women on the power of authority and so on. And then one, my second question is, what, do we, what are we going to do for that? That is one question. The second one is, is the glass ceiling in the hierarchy of politics is very strong, stronger than what we have in the employment sector or whatever, where rising in the various levels of power, is it going to, is it very difficult to crack that uh, glass ceiling? Because we, we see several women showing interest, raising their voice, showing to, uh, interest in the politics, but they never get to enter into it once they get and once they enter, they stop at the first level or at the second level, not reach at the different uh, levels. Uh, mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, at least I see in several uh, governments, we see, we see a woman, a woman minister, I mean, at least in our different countries, that woman is given a social welfare, not, uh, now we have a finance minister in India, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, how many uh, of them rise to that level? is another thing, why is that glass ceiling very, yeah. very, very hard to crack? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So those questions, the focus on elect her, that focus on her and how do we convince more people that this matters and also the glass ceiling. Um, I'll go to Tala in the first instance. 
Sure. So um, I, I, you're, you're, you're quite right. If we talk amongst ourselves or we talk to people who understand it and are on side, how are we going to create any kind of social change? Um, and we do need to create more of a public narrative around this. We do need to tackle the kind of the myths, uh, particularly around quotas, the idea that quotas are giving an unfair advantage to women. They're levelling a playing field that is unfair. They promote merit, you know, that, that's, the, that's the point. There's this um, myth that we exist in a meritocracy and those people who have the skills are the ones that get to the top, but no, it's who has opportunity in networks, financial privilege, etc. Um, we do need a wider conversation. What's interesting is in polling about would you like to see a, a, a more representative parliament, would you like to see people from working class backgrounds, um, from uh, communities of colour, disabled people, women in politics, the general polling is yes, we think that's a good idea. Where we don't see that change are those people who are the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is a lot of pushback, often called um, you know, any push for progress dismissed as being woke, which, by the way, means pursuing social justice. So I'm not sure why that's dismissed. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that actually progress is dismissed and othered by those who stand to lose out if it actually became a meritocracy. So we've got to, the people that are needed in the room that we need to get on side and we need to hold questions and accountability are gatekeepers who have had more of the slice of the pie than they should have the whole time. The second question that you asked is about the glass ceiling. You're absolutely right. When women are in positions, what tends to happen is that you will see they are less likely to get um, uh, positions that have budgets associated with them. So they're not the ones that are in charge of the money. They are often given um, stereotypical roles when there are in politics. And again, that is about gatekeeping because money is power. Money is decision making. Money is influence. So it's the same issue about who gatekeeps and how we, we tackle their gatekeeping. Sophie, would you like to respond? I think um, to follow on that point, although we do see women in positions of power, um, that's not ingrained within the system. I think that's the key point. Um, although we do have a female first minister and have had female leaders of parties, are we seeing that within the system? And I don't think that's the case. Um, and I think a lot of work needs to be done on that. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it goes back to everything that we've been saying about change in the system. That's the key problem that we're seeing. Um, there is a willingness for progress, um, but it's not being reflected by those who can actually make change or make progress. Thank you. Fiona, would you like to comment on particularly in your own work on that glass ceiling question? The glass ceiling uh, <laughs> for the black woman is a concrete ceiling. <laughs> uh, you don't even see what's there, <laughs> and and I think I, I think there there's several things we've said here around that that we need to work with, but two things that I'll say. The first is around the culture that we have here in Scotland. Um, I'm trying hard not to use father sayings, but I can't hold back. <laughs> and so a roaring lion. <laughs> does not mean just because it's roaring, it will catch game, okay? So a roaring lion will only catch game if it acts. And I think we talk a lot about what we intend to do. We have so many policies and recommendations and we have all these fantastic strategic documents. They speak, they do not act. They remain uh, intentions mm -hmm. on paper. And so we need us here in Scotland and, our, our, and, and, and all the agencies to act on what we are saying. We do not need any more recommendations on top of recommendations when we have ones that we've not acted upon. So we need to see some action. And consequently, the second thing is we need to hold account those that have said they will act. Because when we stop the behavior of applauding what I am going to do and challenging me to what I said I'm going to do, then we will see some action. So we need to hold account when we say we are going to act, have we acted and why have we not acted if we haven't? And if we have, what do we learn from it? So 
it, it has to be that to you know we need to start thinking around the way we are proactive in what we say we are going to do and be held account to every word that we say so that we can break that glass ceiling so that we can start to see more progress otherwise we are continually clapping our hands because they said they are going to do because we said we are going to do but actually nothing is happening and if it is it's very little compared to what was said is going to be done Mary, would you like to comment yeah i think um your point and many of the points come back to both the the points about needing to have multiple strategies or having you know, a wider range of strategies. There are strategies that are around attitude change, education, as you mentioned, things around reforming party culture and institutional culture. And all of those are important together. I think what we have to be cautious of is assuming that once we get to a certain point, progress will be straightforward. And we get a lot of these kind of edicts, like it'll take 65 years for women to be 50-50, you know, right kind of thing. But that assumes progress is straightforward. And actually, the story of our political institutions, precisely because these norms are hardwired into them and they were created by particular groups for particular groups, is um, actually one of backlash and resistance. So oftentimes, what you'll see, and I think some of the sexual harassment stories, for example, coming out of Westminster and others, are an example of, of, of backlash or resistance to progress. Um, and so that, in part, comes to your second question about why not more women at the top, because um, uh, in the Scandinavian institutions, they talked a lot about um, when, when those high numbers of women got in, in the Scandinavian countries, kind of power moved to other places, right? Um, and there's a really interesting example of um, a really great study of US state legislatures where an uh, influx of women came in and they got positional power in the committees and what they men did is they talked more, <laughs> right? So the women were there and they were in positional power, but men dominated the, the, the conversation. They actually they measured. Right? How, how many did it talk? So, so I think it's also about thinking about, you know, again, this, this, this cycle, this pathway, uh, and this multi-pronged resistance or, um, reform strategy, because it's not just about getting women in, but it's about supporting them when they're in there, yeah. which then also has a cyclical effect on who wants to go into politics, yeah. going back to, to, to our earlier points. So, so, so that's kind of where I, I, I see these points as coming together on that point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think points have been made there by our panellists about the need to look at outcomes. You know, what do people say they're going to do, but what do they actually do? Um, one of the things that Parliament is doing at the moment is undertaking an audit which seeks to better understand what the barriers to equal representation in the Parliament are. And as part of that work, we've actually been looking at who's making contributions on which subject. Um, some of it perhaps isn't as surprising as, as you might like it to be, but very interestingly, for the first time, we've been looking at interventions, who makes them, who takes them. And I think one of the figures that have come back that have been quite striking is that both men and women in the chamber are more likely to take interventions from men. And interventions from women are refused more frequently, but also that um, our, our male politicians are making I think 63% of the intervention. So there's a marked difference there. And it's really important to me um, to make sure that everyone has optimal opportunity to represent their constituents as fully as they're able in the chamber. So we want to make sure that democracy is working. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's clear I've had a, a long interest in this session. I, I, I'm not a, a party representative, but previously I, I, I just think it's really important that we continue to have these discussions until we're at a situation where it's wholly normalised and, and the outcome is clear for everyone to see. We have in this last session, you know, finally we, ha we have two women of, of colour in the Parliament, but that's taken over 20 years. We have our, our first permanent wheelchair user in the Parliament. The Parliament is more diverse this session and I think it would be, you know, it'd be a real backward step if we lost that momentum. So I think these discussions are, are very, very key. There's, you, you've had your hand up for some time at the front. Um, and we'll come back out, get as many questions in as possible. Uh, I'm really lucky that I want to go into politics. I'm really lucky that I've had the inspiration that we've had. Sorry, can you speak up? Oh, you sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Go. I wasn't holding the microphone close enough. <laughs> um, but I'm really lucky that I've had women in Parliament to look up to. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know that politics was an option until I was 18 years old, about to go into university. And even though when I'm in university, I have a lot of female students who are studying alongside me, but I never see that represented in politics. 
So it's like more the transition between 18 to graduating. How do we get more women within that age? I guess it goes back to all the uh, questions, but like, how would you specifically inspire or talk to those women saying, well, yes, research is important, but you do have an option in politics. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sophie, would you like to pick up on that? Uh, I think um, I've just finished my first year at university studying politics and sociology, and I, I would echo that you do see a lot of women in, in those rooms, but you write it isn't um, bridging the gap into to kind of the real world. Um, and I think, yeah, that's it's a really interesting point to bring up. Um, I think that we are seeing a lot more role models for women, um, but I I personally don't want to go into politics at the moment um, because of the toxicity, um, especially within party politics. And I think that's probably a case for a lot of women. Um, I'm really interested in the, the subject and I'm really interested in social issues. Um, but, but actually going into the role um, an elected office um, is quite a daunting thought um, and, I, and I'm sure that echoes with a lot of young women. Um, and yeah, I think that a lot of what we've talked about needs to happen before it is a safe environment that women, young women want to go into. Um, and I think that's probably one of the main problems um, why we're not seeing the transition of the amount of women who are interested actually taking up um, our standing for election. Thank you. I'm aware there are a few hands going up, so I'm going to try and get in more questions. Can we go to the back row there first? Thank you. Hi. Um, I arrived slightly late, so this question may have been asked already, but it was just to ask, I think from personal experience, I think young people who want to go into kind of a position, or young women who want to go into a position of power normally have someone to look up to or someone maybe in their family who inspires them. So it's more a personal question to the panel, who has inspired you to go into your position of power as a female and also how do you think we can implement that so every young woman has that? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I think we'll start with Fiona and work back this way. Thank you. So um, I think um, the, the, the aspect of uh, of, of role models is really key. We, we, we talk about it and sometimes you feel like it's talked about a lot. But for me, it's, a thought, it's the thinking around role models not necessarily on the outside, role models on the inside. So I fell into this, I thought, because I got into a situation that pushed me to think about change. But there are certain things that happened on the way that I realized said something to me. First of all, when we came to Scotland with my family uh, 15 years ago, and I'd lived in London nearly 10 years already. And when we came to Scotland, I thought that, being, uh, that I needed to work hard to integrate into the society, to work hard to assimilate, to be part of the community. And then I met fantastic, uh, and, and, and I need to say, white women and, and white people that welcomed us and said, um, what, why, why are you in this situation? Why are you not allowed to work? We don't understand. And they educated me on understanding that the system was failing me, but I didn't know that. And so having people around me and women around me, and in my actual role, I have women that have sponsored me, that have mentored me, that have spoken for me in the rooms where I have not been allowed as a black woman. But the influence for me to be in a position, and, and I, I'm, I'm in some ways privileged because I didn't know that women are not allowed to speak or you can't speak in certain areas. Because I was brought up by a single mother. I, we never had dad in the house from when I was little. She never remarried, she never met anybody. I mean, when she speaks, everybody shuts up. So <laughs> even now, I mean, she'll speak and we'll all shut up, regardless of whether you're a man or woman. So subconsciously, I must have taken that in because I thought you, the only person I wasn't supposed to speak back to was my mom. Everybody else I'm not necessarily afraid. I may be cautious because I know the consequences, but I was never quite that afraid. And then 
there's something somebody else asked about speaking to the wider audience. Um, I, I am privileged to have a husband that actually will go so far to make sure that I am supported. And I can't underestimate that. But I think that we need that encouragement. We need those role models. We need to know. I subconsciously knew that it's OK for me to speak, and it's OK for me to challenge. And I am privileged that way. But I think we need to pass that on. So passing it on to my daughter has been more challenging because she's a black girl in a school where she's experienced racism. But we need to continue that domino effect and try and encourage that support mechanism. Mm -hmm. Sophie? I'm, I think a lot of my role models are, are the young women that I'm surrounded with. Um, my role at SYP as chair of a charity is, is a really unique one. Um, you don't meet a lot of 19 year old girls who are also <laughs> chairs of charities. It's normally um, slightly older men um, <laughs> and white. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a really interesting um, position to take and someone who's really inspired me is Molly, who's my vice chair. Um, she is an incredible speaker um, and she is continuously advocating for the voices of young women and I really look up to her and her abilities and skills um, to, to speak on such important issues. And I also think um, someone who came before me, Suki Wan, um, was a previous SYP chair and I really look up to her um, and the work that I do now in the role um, and I think she was a, a perfect example of what you should make the role into. Um, and yeah, so those are just two young women who are also in my life who have inspired me. Thank you. Tell that. Um, so it's interesting, I, you know, you talked about um, having somebody else in the family who maybe is interested in politics. So I am, um, my parents are, are migrants here uh, from, from Pakistan and I'm second generation here. So we weren't, um, their second language is, is, is English. We weren't a family where growing up, you know, it was the Sunday newspapers and coffee and it wasn't it wasn't a um, politics wasn't conversational politics was being lived politics was being lived through the experiences of poverty politics was being lived through the experiences of racism through inequality and so those conversations were had so I think the way we create role modeling is actually we we need to expand what the term politics is so we need to start talking about it, not in a what's happening in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament, what's happening in our lives and what are the consequences of politics. What's politics within our communities? What's politics within our, our streets and our neighbourhoods and our green spaces? I think if we can make the term politics become synonymous with our everyday lives, because it is, all of these decisions having a drip drip effect to everything happening in our lives, the transport that you got to get here, the experience you're going to have when you leave here, the pay that you take home at the end of the month, all of these are political consequences and decisions. So rather than finding somebody else who is in the political arena to be a role model, I think we all need to be role models in reclaiming what politics is. Meryl? Yeah, I think um, Talat's really nicely brought the two questions together, which is that we, we are on this panel and we tend to focus a lot on formal political institutions, but that actually politics is more encompassing and that, and that politics is richer if people bring those experiences from small p politics to big p politics and from different walks of life. Um, and I think um, there's a lot of work about why do people want to stand for office and, and men are more likely to cite power and recognition and, and women are more <laughs> likely to cite things around collective goals or, or cooperation. That doesn't mean I'm making essentialist arguments about, about uh, who wants what. But also women are more likely to say that their kind of influences come through conversations with family members and others rather than, for example, a, a political person. Uh, tapping him on the shoulder. In terms of my own career, I can't say that I am in any kind of position of power. I think that's probably a misreading of my, of my uh, relative uh, influence. But um, uh, my, uh, I uh, studied politics at an undergraduate institution in, in the United States where there were no classes on uh, women uh, in politics at all. Um, and I did a semester abroad as a young, fresh-faced student in 2002 as an intern in the first term of the Scottish Parliament. 
and I needed a project to work on, and the MSP I was assigned to was Linda Fabiani of the SMP, formerly Deputy Presiding Officer, and she gave me a big folder with all of the documents of the first 50-50 campaign for the Scottish Parliament. And now I research women in Scottish politics. So I think there are moments that tip us onto particular paths, um, and, I, and I'm grateful for that one. Now, I'm, I'm going to see, we, I'm going to take yourself there. I will come to those who, who've had an earlier opportunity, if at all possible. Uh, so this is possibly a slightly niche question, but to link back to education, I go to a traditionally all girls school and the kind of philosophy behind that is to make, you know, young women more confident statistically, women when they're in the classroom or young girls when they're in the classroom perform better away from like the male gaze or male teachers or, you know, what have you. And I think, I mean, I'm quite, I would say I'm a pretty confident person. I think it has worked to a degree, but then if you rely on all girls' schools in that way, you're not actually stopping the problem at its root, you're just delaying the problem until like, we um, like, go into wider society. So I'm just wondering, like, what are everybody's thoughts on like, the role of um, all girls' schools and how they like, feed into misogyny and also women like, being ambitious in the workplace? Okay, thank you. Um, Sophie, I'd be interested to hear what, what your views are there. Uh, I mean, I don't know much about um, all girls' schools, but I think that um, framing that as a solution is not the answer. Um, it, we, we're not working on women's behaviour. What needs to change is men's. Um, and just segregating isn't going to stop that. Um, I think rather than that, more needs to be done um, and schools with, with all children um, on, on bettering um, boys' and men's behaviour. Um, I know in our school we had the White Ribbon campaign come in and they talked to, to all the boys um, in our year um, on, on their behaviour and how to, how to change that. Um, so I would say, although it, it might help develop skills, I think that just um, delays the problem for later on. Yeah, um, interestingly, I went to an all-girls school, um, and uh, it was also one of the best schools in the country, in Uganda, where I come from. And it only came to my attention recently, that research around an all-girls school. But the girls' school I went to, um, and I hope my OGs, my girls, old girls won't hear me saying this. <laughs> but I don't, I don't feel like it made me confident. I think it still comes down to the culture in which we are. Maybe it did, I don't know. But I think it still comes down to the culture in which we find ourselves. Um, the, there is, uh, the, there's, don't know if anybody's aware of the, the, the monkeys experiment, where um, the, the, the person that did the experiment uh, uh, brought some monkeys into a, in, into a cage and, uh, and put bananas at the top and every time they went for the bananas they, this, they splashed water on them and later on they brought in other monkeys that hadn't had that experience and they pulled down the monkeys that the, 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 one, the older ones pulled down the new monkeys because they thought, they felt there was that thinking within the cage that if you went for the bananas, you would be splashed water on, so it was a bad experience. The reason I bring that is because the culture that we've cultivated will determine what we play out even in a girl's school to an extent. Whilst that might do something, it is not going to do much to separate the girls. Because where I come from, we girls are taught to be submissive, to not speak up, to listen to the men, regardless of whether they are speaking rubbish or not. Um, and I say that gently, just in case my kin's people hear me. No, but seriously, we were, we, were, we were brought up in a culture where you dare not speak up, where you have to be carried in a certain way. There were some fantastic things. Of course, you see girls step up to leadership, and you have you know, the, the, the girl leaders and everything. But there, there is a culture that we need to change that is about um, thinking not just what we have cultivated, which is 
women have a certain place in life or a certain place in society where we place them and they have to accept that. We need to be thinking about how women contribute equitably and the importance and value that women bring to society. If we change our culture, it does not matter where we do it, whether it is just in an all-girls school or outside of that, it will change and transform the way we behave. And yes, I take on board the aspect that we need to bring along the men and everybody else with us because it is not us that perpetuate it. It's the society that has created that thinking and we are buying into it sometimes without thinking about it. If you find a woman who thinks that way, they will still behave that way because they've been in a system that thinks that way. So we need to change the systems, we need to change our culture, and we need to change our thinking around who women are. Somebody said, they don't know who we are because sometimes we ourselves don't know who we are. So we need to know who we are the same way the systems need to know who we are. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I, okay, I'm going to take, there's a question at the back. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, this question might have, I guess, been answered in part, but just before this, I was at a discussion about the strong men in politics and <laughs> how that impacts our democracy. And I was wondering, what do you say to women, but more specifically young women who look to politics right now and they see a world of Johnsons and Trumps and how, how do we bring that sort of authentic self to our politics without feeling the need to compete with this sort of idealised strong man that we see in our day-to-day -day politics in the UK, in the US and elsewhere? Thank you. And um, yeah, you were obviously having a, a day at the Festival of Politics. Um, Talat, would you like to address that one? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so um, mm -hmm. politics doesn't need more strong men. All right, it doesn't need, and, and even the, the, the idea mm -hmm. of like the Trumpian politics, the, um, fr the you know, dismissing of expertise, the, the very, very hierarchical model of politics where it's this man at the top, we have actually fallen back into that and that's a consequence of a rise of populism okay so if we want to talk about strong and healthy democracies we have to talk about the backlash that we're getting towards progress okay um we have we are making i i like to console myself by saying this is the last push against social justice from people who are losing their power okay that's how i like to console myself with <laughs> everything that's happening so I usually rock back and forth in the fetal position and say it to myself quite often currently <laughs> but the point is is that we the last thing we need is for more people to model themselves on what is currently there and for women to have to feel like they also have to perform in that way to be politicians we're seeing a little bit of that in certain leadership elections <laughs> that might be happening I'll stop talking um, <laughs> But the, the fact is there's a game being played here, a competition that is looking at traditionalist authoritarian type politicians and the strong men and trying to replicate that. It's not what we need. Healthy democracies need different types of people working in different types of ways. And they need to reflect the way that we are working most of the time in our lives, which is not in that method. So if we want to um, invite um, people from marginalised backgrounds, people with intersecting inequalities, young people and women into politics, we have to change what we expect of politicians and then what we allow politicians to do when we're there as well. So there's an accountability issue and we need to challenge and change what we think of as leadership. I'm very conscious of time and I know two members of, of, of our audience have had their hands up several times again so we will get, well I'm going to take one, I'll take you both together and put your question to Meryl to see what we can do with time remaining. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Um, I'm really enjoying the conversation so don't mind my questions. My question would be what you just touched on about um, that if we're going to allow women to shine, we need men in the room and also men have to take the responsibility. Uh, you also spoke about strategies. I was wanted to find out from you guys if there are any strategies that you think can help men come on the table and be partakers for allowing women to shine. 
as I know that men may be the barriers in politics, some women, yes, but I do know that men also need to support women empowerment. So do you have any strategies or ideas that you think could help? Okay, thank you. And forward here too. We'll take those two together. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, mine wasn't a question so much as to say, having heard Meryl refer to this question about the proportion of women interrupting men, men, women, and so on, I thoroughly recommend as a good read, and if you don't want to buy it, force your public library to buy it, um, The Authority Gap by the respected journalist Marianne Seacart. It's a good read. She's done various talks, including one for the RSA, lots of bits online. Um, take a read, take a look. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Meryl. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, I think your, your question also taps into the, the previous question, uh, your question about, about uh, kind of uh, what can men do. But it's also about that we, in terms of, and this has come up a few times, but that, that we tend to focus on women's political underrepresentation, but actually we need to flip the question and focus on men's overrepresentation, um, not only in terms of making that the problem, but also in terms of interrogating the, the ways in which that is maintained, right? Um, and I think then your question, one uh, slightly provocative suggestion I'd have, which comes, comes from a, a great gender politics scholar, Rainbow Murray, is we should stop talking about quotas for women, right, in terms of requiring parties to select a, a certain proportion of women. We should start talking about quotas for men, right? In, <laughs> thank you. One clap. Um, <laughs> thank you. Someone minute that. Um, but um, but ex because it's about reframing the question and it's about making it about quality, uh, legitimacy, uh, democracy for all. Um, and there's some very interesting stuff uh, coming out of Sweden, for example, in research that shows that when you implement quotas, what happens is the quality of male candidates increases. <laughs> Because what happens is a lot of, they call it the, the, the fall of the mediocre man, right? But that once you have quotas, that the quality of candidates overall increases, because oftentimes women candidates are more qualified than their counterparts, but that also the quality of men increases. So I think it's, it's reframing, it's going back to those core questions about meritocracy, about democracy, about representation, and flipping the question. And doing that requires, as you say, looking at men's over-representation, not just women's under-representation. I think I'll maybe come in there. When I, when I first got in pol involved in politics, which is accidentally in my 30s, um, joined a local campaign with neighbours to try and save a playing field. Um, so do not come from a political background. I'd previously only engaged really with electoral politics in, in that I voted and would never not do that. Um, but just found the whole prospect actually pretty terrifying. And it's fair to say I've been very well supported along the way by by, by women and men. But the fact of the matter is here we are in 2022 and we just have to look at representation globally um, and in our own country to see that we need to do far more. And we've obviously had a, a pretty good discussion this afternoon about what some of that might look like. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that mentoring and, and training is not going to get us where we need to be. Um, you know, I've, I've taken part in meetings as an elected representative where I think Talat's point earlier about you know childcare being seen as a women's issue, not an economic one, is sort of pertinent to to, to my own experience, where I would have a, a room full of, of women who were you know really upset about the closure of a particular local asset, you know whether it be a, a nursery or a you, you know just something that was very well used. But then we'd go into that decision making space, and those voices weren't weren't there. So I think this you, you know it's why this is such an important issue. And, and one that we have to keep talking about. But I do think we're, it, it's gaining more attraction. I think the days where we would see an all-male panel are, they're less frequent, aren't they? There are people now who will not take part in that panel because they understand the importance of diversity. So there's change on the way, but it, you know we, we don't want to be waiting and waiting and waiting. And your point about, you, you, there's very much, that sentence you, you can't be what you can't see I think is, is very, it's, it's obviously the point you're making, where are the young people in our political spaces? Our parliament should be representative of everyone. I'm aware that at a recent um, Elector webinar, organisers were told by the disabled women present that they need allies. And 
I think it'd be useful if we just have a, a wee sort of as we round off our discussion about how we can be better allies for for disabled women, for women who face you know prejudice as a result of you know being from an ethnic minority, for those who fear who face even greater barriers um, than I might have experienced. You know, I think it's fair to say if you'd. Um, I often say this, my, my teachers might say, no, not at all, that's absolute nonsense. But I feel like when I was at school, if they'd said in the classroom, so who's least likely to ever find themselves in the parliament? I kind of feel they would have pointed to me and that, you know, my journey has, has only been possible as a result of a great amount of support from a great amount of people. But that, that is one thing, so the point has been made, but we need to make sure these things are absolutely embedded and that it is possible for a representative parliament to become the absolute norm. But on that point of how we can be better allies to those who want to get involved, um, I think I'll start with Meryl and work that way, and we're probably going to run out of time after that. Yeah, I would say um, two things, um, which is one, always asking the other questions. So always asking um, which women and, and interrogating kind of the assumptions that we're making about particular things and, and who's included, who's not included, and, and the second would be, um, tying back to our earlier discussion, is um, a part, of the, part of the reason that we don't have equal representation is because it involves people giving up power right, to others. So, so I think part of that question also ties into being allies, giving space to others, giving power to others. So. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, um, you know, the term privilege tends to get people's backs up. But what it what it means is understanding where you may have experienced disadvantage or where you experience advantage, whether it's because of the fact that you are um, white and you're in a, a, a place where you haven't experienced racial prejudice as a consequence of that, whether it's because you're a man, whether it's because you are not disabled, whether it's the fact that you're straight. You have to acknowledge your own privileges to be able to understand somebody else's oppressions. So part of the work that allyship does is make itself knowledgeable about experiencing experiences. One of the hardest things that I come across is when I have to explain why something was sexist, when I have to explain why something was racist, why something was Islamophobic, to those people who think of themselves as being progressive and understanding and on board. So actually, if you want to be an ally, you have to be educated on the issues as they are faced by those who are minoritized. And you have to be willing to put your own privilege on the line by being the person who shouts about it rather than the person who's marginalised, always having to be the person that has to put themselves on the line. So how much of your power are you willing to share? Are you going to be, how are you going to educate yourself? And how are you going to be an active bystander um, in dealing with it rather than the person who's experienced the discrimination, the oppression, the inequality, having to be the one who has to shout against it all the time? That's allyship for me. Thank you. Sophie? I think saying that you're an ally um, is not enough. It, it's the actions that count. Um, and I think that it's, it's so important to give room to, to the voices from settled and heard groups. Um, with an SYP, we're doing a lot of work on making sure that they're at the front of cent and centre of consultations. Um, and also on the topic of education, I think that's really important as well. Um, at SYP, we've worked with In Intercultural Youth Scotland to run a series of trainings, um, anti-racist trainings for our membership to better understand how to support um, and advocate for the voices of people of colour. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of that is, is making sure that the space is there in any room that you are in um, for people from seldom heard groups to, to have to, to come in and be able to speak for themselves. If you want So three things that I would say and with everybody, what everybody else has said. Um, uh, I think part, one of the things is just educate ourselves. So educating yourself or educating myself allows me to become more self-aware. Why do I want to do, why do I want to be an ally? And secondly, what does that look like? But the second aspect of that is that it allows me not to be a perpetrator of it. Why? Because sometimes we internalize things we don't know or we don't understand or we don't realize what they are and we perpetrate those things. We, 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 we just do those things because that's what we've seen. So understanding and being self-aware is key. The last thing that I would say on the issue of allyship 
is we must understand it and understand ourselves and be self-aware because the danger is that we start talking about allyship, allyship, and in, in fact what we are saying is that those that are not marginalized validate those that are marginalized. Mm -hmm. So whilst it's really important for somebody to speak about anti-racism, when you spoke about anti-racism, it was, it, was, it was quite powerful because first of all, you're young. From, I'm, I'm older, so you're young. <laughs> and you represent for me what we need to be seeing in society. But what I have also heard is from my fellow black people saying we don't need to speak about anti-racism because it is a negative term, because they've internalized that. And so being self-aware will change how we do things, but it ensures that the white person, for example, does not validate my point, that I don't get not heard because they have to hear the white person, that the disabled person doesn't get not heard until the a, me who is not disabled cannot, can speak for them. So we have to understand what is allyship and what is it not, and where are we going with it. Thank you. Um, I think at that point we, we have to very, very quickly. <laughs> I, I can, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm pretending I can't see the people at the back. Just carry on. <laughs> right, can I just say to parents and grandparents here, make sure you teach the boys the respect for girls yeah. and women and tell them they're equal. Bring them up that way. I was a teacher for 23 years and often it's the mother that makes the boys superior to the girls. Okay, thank you. We are absolutely going to, we're, we're, we're going to end there. I'd like to, to thank you all for taking part, for your questions, for your contributions, and to thank our partners, Elector. And I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking our panelists, Fiona Matovo, Sophie Reed, Talat Yacoub, and Dr. Meryl Kenny for giving up their time to take part. <laughs> Bravo. I know too you'll want to thank our BSL interpreters, Shorna Dixon and Heather Graham. Thank you. And can I just take this opportunity to remind everyone that the Festival of Politics continues with many events, um, including a reading from the National Theatre of Scotland on care experience people, and in conversation with the best-selling uh, poet and playwright Lem Sissy about his memoir, My Name Is Why, that will take place tomorrow, as well as what I know will be lively discussions on trust in politicians and another on the state of the UK Union. So we look forward to welcoming you all back tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.